My name is Tatiana Jasti. Welcome to the Middle East Institute's uh, flagship series, Middle East 101. Um, last week, we spoke about the imminent transition to a post-oil era and the risks and opportunities accompanying that for the countries of the Middle East. Now, alongside that, another risk is emerging that, while longer term, could potentially be more destructive. And I'm talking, of course, of climate change. There is ample evidence that the Middle East region will be acutely affected by climate change. Uh, it's projected to result in prolonged heat waves, uh, greater water scarcity, desertification, uh, rise in sea levels, which would particularly pose a threat to a region that has most of its urban centers um, along the sea. So you have uh, low-lying coastal areas in uh, the UAE, Kuwait, Qatar, that will be at extreme risk. The effects of climate change could also potentially exacerbate conflict elsewhere in the region as drought and desertification lead to competition for increasingly scarce resources. So the threat would appear to be existential for many countries in the region. Um, you have extreme climate forecasts coupled with the end of the oil era fast approaching, creating a double bind, if you like, for countries, including the states in the Gulf. Most if not all the Gulf states have acknowledged the severity of climate change and have pledged to take action. However, with the decline in finances from dwindling oil revenues, they will have fewer resources and less money to go around and fund subsidies and infrastructure projects. Uh, reshaping an economy so entrenched in oil revenues will be tough under, un, under any circumstances and it is even more difficult during COVID-19 and the current global economic downturn. Uh, there could very well be little appetite for all but the most necessary of climate change measures. So to help us make sense of the issues and more, we have with us Dr. Aisha Al-Sarihi. We included Aisha's, Dr. Aisha's bio when we publicized today's talk. So I'm just going to say a few lines uh, by way of introduction. Um, Dr. Aisha obtained her PhD from Imperial College's Center for Environmental Policy, following which she pursued her postdoctoral research at LSE's Middle East Center where she examined the economic implications of climate change in the GCC. Aisha has also previously been a visiting scholar at the Georgetown University Center for Contemporary Art Arab Studies. Currently, she is a non-resident fellow at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, DC, where her research interests include the political economy, renewable energy, and climate change with a focus on the Arab region. So I'm really glad to have with her have her with us and um, I'm really looking forward to what she has to say today. Before we start, um, let me take the audience through what's going to happen. Dr. Aisha will speak first for about uh, 45 minutes, after which we'll go into Q&A um, and that will take us until the one and a half hour mark. Uh, that still gives us a bit of time for Q&A, so I'd like to encourage those listening and watching to give us more, to ask more questions. Now back to Dr. Aisha, uh, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Tatiana. Thank you for the introductions. Um, so I also would like to thank the Middle East Institute for uh, inviting me to give this lecture uh, today. So I was asked to, to speak about the climate change in the desert. Uh, uh, however, given that my research focus was uh, uh, on the GCC over the last three to four years, so I will focus on the GCC region. And I will specifically focus on the uh, energy, economy, and climate uh, interlinks. Um, so, in today's uh, lecture, okay. Uh, in today's lecture, I will uh, focus on uh, four uh, main themes. The first one, uh, I will give a background. Uh, on oil producing Gulf Arab states, and we will look at the, con the economic context, uh, the, the uh, energy demand, uh, and the greenhouse gas emissions in the region, um, so we can have um, a kind of a perspective, uh, uh, because the climate change effects uh, differentiate from one region and the other, and the co economic context uh, define how the region is uh, affected. The second part uh, will be focused on uh, understanding the physical and economic implications of the climate change in the Gulf 
part of the states. Third, uh, we, uh, I will address the question uh, uh, on uh, how the Gulf Arab states are addressing the climate change from both a governmental, uh, uh, at the government level, and I will speak a little bit about uh, the role of the citizens uh, in uh, addressing the climate change. And fourth, uh, I will uh, speak about uh, or uh, addressing the question, is the Gulf, are the Gulf Arab states doing enough uh, in terms of addressing the climate change? So let's start uh, with the background uh, on the oil producing Gulf Arab states. Uh, so I'll speak about the, the economy, the energy demand, the greenhouse gas emissions in the region, and we will look at the interlink between these three elements. And by the way, what you see in the background, uh, this is uh, Riyadh at night, uh, where I am uh, currently speaking from. So I thought I would start with a few pictures uh, from the region. So um, I don't know, like perhaps, uh, uh, especially for those uh, who are not uh, in the region at the moment or who have uh, never visited the region before, perhaps when we see, uh, say, the, the Gulf Arab states, maybe the first thing that comes to mind is desert. So I put a picture for uh, Rob Al-Khali. Or perhaps you would think of the skylines, and here we have uh, the media city uh, in Dubai. Or you could think of, uh, you know, maybe the solar panels, uh, uh, and um, here we, we can see some solar panels uh, on the rooftop of a commercial building, uh, also in Dubai. So, although I am from the region, uh, I, I, I never been to the Rab al Khali. I mean, I, I never been to the, the the, the real desert part. Uh, so I have taken the last two pictures, but I borrowed the, the first picture from, the, from Google. And I guess maybe um, and the other thing that comes to mind and maybe it is missing uh, in this collection of pictures is, um, you know, uh, maybe when we say the Gulf Arab state, you, you quickly think about the, the oil. Indeed, um, the oil and gas, uh, 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 the Gulf uh, Arab states is a home for uh, almost 30% of global oil reserves and around 20% of um, uh, global natural gas reserves. And then there are studies that uh, say that um, at the current production rates, uh, the, the Gulf uh, region uh, could continue to uh, provide the globe with oil and gas for the next 100 years. Uh, another important element that I want uh, to uh, highlight on uh, is how the oil and gas export are dominating uh, the uh, uh, export portfolio for the Gulf Arab states. So if we look, for example, at 2013 and before uh, the oil prices has dropped and affected uh, the, um, the, the, the total exports. Um, so for example, um, in the UAE, it could uh, uh, account for 60% uh, in the UAE and it, uh, and it can reach uh, over 90% of total exports uh, for Kuwait. Also to, uh, to, to show how significant uh, the contribution of the oil revenues are uh, on the GCC economies, it's uh, to look at the contribution uh, of the oil revenues and the GDP. Again, if we uh, uh, just not looking at the, the, the period between 2014 and 2017, where the oil prices has dropped and then the contribution of the oil revenues has also uh, uh, went down. Uh, so, if we look at the UAE, it, it could account for uh, around 25%, uh, um, and uh, for, for Kuwait, it can reach 60% uh, of the GDP. And it fluctuates, the contribution in the GDP fluctuates at the uh, oil prices in the international ma market uh, fluctuate. Another important thing that I would like to highlight on in today's presentation is the, uh, the, the, the increase in the energy demand uh, in the region. Uh, 
uh, it, it surged uh, by 5% per year on average. And what we see in the figure, we see uh, the, the, the energy use on per capita basis across the Gulf Arab states. And I highlighted them uh, in yellow. And you could see how uh, the Gulf Arab states are actually dwarfing other major uh, and advanced economies like the US, Japan, UK, uh, China, and the world average in terms of the energy use. And that there are many factors that uh, contribute to this uh, high uh, energy consumption in the region. First of all is the, the hot weather. Uh, so uh, the air conditioning here uh, account for almost 60 to 80 percent of electricity consumption uh, in the region. Uh, the population growth is another factor. Uh, high standards of liv living, um, the low uh, prices of fuel and electricity. Uh, this also is a contributor, uh, as well as the general uh, expansion uh, of the industries in the region. What else? Uh, major, uh, the majority of the energy uh, sources uh, in the region is, uh, is coming from uh, oil and natural gas. Um, uh, the renewable energy is uh, used in here, but uh, uh, as you can see in the figure, the, the oil and gas dominate the energy consumption, uh, and it's almost uh, covering 99%. Uh, but there is some uh, a fraction of renewable. It is not uh, very clear in this figure, but I will expand more on the use of uh, renewable energy later uh, in, the, in the presentation. Uh, but um, because of this uh, high reliance uh, on uh, oil and gas for the domestic energy use, what uh, we observed in the region, and this information is from World Research Institute, uh, we, we see um, that um, greenhouse gas emissions are increasing across the Gulf Arab states uh, over the time. And uh, the, the Gulf region uh, uh, as a whole is uh, contributing by around 2.6% of global greenhouse gas emissions uh, based on uh, 2016 uh, data. Um, I also wanted to bring this, uh, uh, this um, uh, data. I know it's controversial on, uh, on, the, uh, on how the their capita carbon emissions are calculated. But uh, these data are from the World Bank. And then they show that uh, the Gulf Arab states, uh, which I highlight in red in here, they are uh, ranking the top in the world uh, in terms of their per capita carbon uh, emissions. So I just wanted to start with those few slides. And um, now what I would like to do, uh, um, I would like to do a, a little exercise. So uh, what we will do, uh, I will bring the elements that I just mentioned, and then we will put them together. So we can look at how uh, they are connected to each other. And specifically, we will see how the energy economy and climate uh, change uh, are uh, really connected to each other. Uh, uh, and uh, specifically for the Gulf region, um, I, I mean, I like to use the feedback loops. Uh, they help us to see the bigger picture and how the uh, small elements of the systems are connected to each other. So um, as we mentioned, the oil and gas exports, I, I hope like you see the pointer um, uh, that I'm using. Uh, as we mentioned, oil and gas exports, uh, uh, and the revenues that comes from it plays uh, an, an important role uh, in the GCC economies. And uh, subject to oil prices, as the oil prices are high, then the revenues are high, and then the more you have economic stability. The more you have economic stability, uh, then uh, the, uh, the, expend, uh, the economic uh, or the governmental expenditure will increase. And uh, for the Gulf Arab state, what is important is um, how that contributes also in, in lowering the, the energy prices uh, at the domestic level, 
For example, the electricity prices will go down, the water prices and the fuel prices will go down. However, with, uh, when you have uh, the, the energy price is not reflecting the real cost, then you end up with uh, an increase in the domestic energy consumption, as we have seen in the previous slides. And um, uh, the risk with uh, increasing the domestic energy consumption uh, uh, could lead to you know, um, eating what's supposed to be allocated for the, oil, uh, for, for the, for the export. Um, and this is actually uh, this kind of risk. Uh, the, some of the Gulf countries are experiencing uh, um, this kind of risk. For example, we have Kuwait, uh, Oman, and the UAE has already started uh, to import uh, natural gas um, to meet the, the increasing demand, uh, demand at the domestic level. So, um, with that, uh, uh, you you end up um, uh, I mean, uh, you end up with uh, you disturb the economic stability if you reduce uh, the, the oil and gas uh, export. And this uh, business as usual scenario have been there for a long time, and you, we can see here we have a negative feedback loop. Um, and what I want to say. This is uh, we still we have this negative feedback loop and we still don't have the climate element in there. So uh, let me take this another step farther. If we talk, uh, if we take the climate change uh, uh, into consideration. So as I mentioned, uh, domestic energy consumption is uh, heavily reliant on the oil and gas, uh, and these are associated with the greenhouse gas emissions. The more you increase the greenhouse gas emissions, the more you contribute on disturbing the climate. The, the more we disturb the climate, and then the more we need to bring it back into balance, and then the more we need to cut greenhouse gas emissions. Cutting greenhouse gas emissions, uh, uh, especially they are sourced uh, from the fossil fuel resources, could mean that we reduce the demand for the fossil fuel resources. And for the Gulf Arab states, it, it could mean also we reduce the, 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 um, the demand for the oil and gas exports that come uh, from the region. And with that, we bring another uh, factor of uh, the, that disturb the economic stability in the region. So we have another negative feedback loop. So I know like um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the cutting uh, of the greenhouse gas emissions the, and the transition to alternative energy sources, there, uh, the, it, there is a lot of uncertainty in there. Uh, we, we don't know, uh, ha, we don't have uh, much clarity about the speed of, of the transition. So you can see here that I put some double lines here. Um, uh, they indicate um, the, the delay as well, the uncertainties behind uh, the decline in the demand for the oil and gas. However, um, uh, to just give you a, a picture of what I'm talking about, if you just replace this climate change in here with the COVID-19, uh, then it will give you a glimpse of what I am talking about. So this is the business as usual uh, 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 for the region. Uh, uh, there is a, a negative feedback loop, uh, but uh, I am not here to say that the region is not uh, unaware of those uh, negative feedback loops. Um, so in the next few slides, I will show how the Gulf Arab states have actually already started to break those uh, negative feedback loops and has already started to do something about uh, climate change and to bring more stability into the economy. But before doing that, I also would like to bring um, a third element, which shows that what would happen if we um, advanced uh, the climate action. So um, with the greenhouse gas emissions, if there's an increase and if we decide to advance climate action, that would mean that we would uh, enhance investments in low carbon um, uh, economy. And that could be, for example, um, enhancing investments in renewable energy efficiency, electric vehicles, and what does that mean? That uh, it means that we uh, promote for uh, or uh, enhancing the role of the small medium enterprises, 
the private sector. And what does that mean? It means that we align the climate action with the economic diversification. So theoretically, uh, if we advance the climate action, we could actually end up with a, visited, a positive feedback loop and we could um, contribute in the economic stability. Uh, now, it is not only in the Gulf, but globally, climate action has been viewed as a, a costly option. Uh, but there are so many studies that shows that climate action is actually shouldn't be treated as something separated from the economy. It should be part of the economy because it's going to contribute into uh, or bring many economic, social and environmental uh, benefits. And it could uh, bring more uh, of economic stability uh, uh, rather than otherwise. So I guess um, uh, for, for this section, uh, I, I called it new business model, uh, but uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the Green New Deal, so yeah. So, uh, so this is just to give a bigger picture, but um, uh, in the next slides, uh, I will uh, give a few examples uh, on, uh, on what the Gulf Arab states are actually doing. Um, so uh, before talking about the climate action, and what the Gulf Arab states are doing. Uh, uh, it is important also to look at the physical as well as the economic implications uh, for, for, for the region. So we can have further understanding about what are uh, the drivers and why the Gulf Arab states should be uh, concerned about taking action uh, on climate. So, um, and here, what I'm trying to show, uh, so um, both the empirical data as well as climate uh, models uh, shows that there is an increase in the temperature uh, in the region. Um, to, to make the things a bit uh, more simple, so uh, if we look at the uh, lower uh, or the maps at the lower level, uh, in the worst case scenario, uh, uh, and we mean by the worst case scenario is if the, if the uh, global community doesn't come together and cut greenhouse gas emissions, then there will be an increase in the temperature uh, by the mid and the end of the century. And so the more the darker the color towards red, uh, the more hot it gets. And in the worst case scenario for the Gulf region, it is expected that uh, by the end of the, the century, the temperature could increase by three to almost five degrees Celsius. Um, and um, uh, otherwise, uh, if, if, if the climate action is, has been enhanced, and if we have a moderate case scenario, even if, uh, if the global community enhanced climate action, then the, there will still be an increase uh, in the temperature in the region. And so by the end of the century, the temperature could increase by 1.5 to 2.3 degrees Celsius. And so this increase in the temperature, what it does mean for the Gulf Arab states, it, it means that it could affect the non-oil economic sectors, such as the agriculture, the fishery, the infrastructure, uh, um, uh, sectors um, and um, it could disturb uh, the, the, the process or the ambitions of the economic diversification um, uh, as well as uh, uh, it could affect uh, an important sector for the economic diversification which is the tourism sector. Uh, apart from the temperature, uh, so there is a, a, uh, there are studies that shows the increase in the temperature, for example, um, uh, the increase uh, three uh, degree uh, centigrade warming could cause the GCC large GDP losses of around 0.2 uh, to 0.5% uh, uh, decline every year, uh, starting from 2027 or it could uh, rise up to 1.5 to 3 uh, uh, percent decline uh, in the GDP uh, in a yearly basis, uh, basis starting from 2026. 
uh, to simplify those uh, figures, um, uh, we have two maps here. The first one on the left-hand side, um, it shows that if we uh, don't advance the climate action, then uh, uh, the more darker the color, uh, the more there is the GDP loss. And uh, you can see how uh, red it is here. But if, if the global community has advanced climate action, and then uh, you can, we can reduce the GDP loss. Uh, and uh, um, uh, for, for the Gulf region, uh, the, even with the climate action, there will still be GD, uh, loss in the GDP, uh, uh, but that wouldn't be the same as if we don't take action on climate. So this is uh, uh, the implications on the non oil economic sectors. What else that I want to bring in here? Um, so here are, we have few pictures of uh, some uh, extreme weathers. So here I'm not trying to show you that we have a lot of rain in this region. Uh, and in contrast, the climate change is actually reducing uh, the precipitation or the amount of the rainfall that uh, 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 fall in the region. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, whenever there's a rainfall, sometimes uh, it is associated with some extreme weather like cyclones, uh, flash flood. Uh, uh, and uh, we can see, uh, for example, I have the picture here for Cyclone Gono that hit Oman in 2007. And it caused a lot of economic losses and damage to the infrastructure. Uh, flash floods uh, from Riyadh and uh, from Kuwait. Uh, actually, in this year, uh, uh, in Kuwait, uh, the, the Minister of uh, Public Service had to resign because um, he has been accused for not taking the uh, appropriate uh, precautions uh, to uh, uh, prevent damage. And the empirical data uh, or observations sh shows that Oman, uh, because it is at the coast of the uh, Arabian Sea, has been hit at least four, by four cyclones over uh, the last 12 years alone. So uh, what I'm trying to say, uh, uh, I'm trying to say that the region is faced with new circumstances and uh, uh, the region needs to be ready to face those new circumstances uh, the infrastructure, uh, the way the infrastructure is built needs to be revised. Um, uh, um, uh, and then uh, how those extreme weathers are affecting economy is also something that needs to be considered um, in the near future. Uh, what is more, uh, so uh, in the next two slides, I will, uh, I will uh, highlight on how climate change could also uh, not only impact the non-oil economic sector, but also could bring challenges to the oil, uh, oil sector. So what do we see in this picture? Uh, perhaps most of you are familiar with this picture. Uh, it is uh, the moment uh, when the parties uh, of the United Nations came together uh, in Paris in, in 2015, and uh, they have adopted the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. And what the Paris Climate Agreement entails is that for the parties to submit uh, national determined uh, contributions where they list their uh, mitigation and adaptation ambitions. Um, so, um, and what does that mean for the Gulf Arab states and especially uh, implications to the oil uh, sector? So if we look at the GCC top trade partners, in their NDCs, uh, there is a, a, a lot of uh, movement uh, to avoid using the fossil fuels, be it coal, uh, natural gas, uh, or oil. So if we look at the top trade partners like the EU, Japan, India, and China, uh, all uh, in their NDCs, they have emission reduction targets and for all of them they aim to uh, achieve those emission tar 
targets by 2030 uh, in less than a decade from now. And, and um, even though uh, we have uh, the COVID-19 crisis at the moment, this uh, hasn't uh, posed um, uh, some of the, of the nations like the EU and China uh, from uh, um, prioritizing uh, the green investments as part of their uh, economic recovery packages. So uh, we have seen uh, most recently the EU, for example, is adopting uh, the Green Deal. And the China most recently, I think last week, uh, has pledged to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. So uh, the point here is, um, so these are only a few examples of how the energy transition could look like. Uh, by no means, uh, I have an exhaustive list of uh, what is going on uh, globally and how could that influence uh, the demand for the oil and gas uh, that comes from the Gulf Arab states. Uh, but again, uh, I, I want to emphasize, I know that there is a lot of uh, uh, controversy when we speak about the speed uh, of the energy transition. Uh, and uh, when the, the, the demand of the oil is going uh, to peak, there is uh, a lot of uncertainty in there. But I think the point is um, when you deal with uncertainty, uh, it's important uh, to uh, consider all, all, all kinds of the scenarios, the good and the worst case scenarios, rather than just doing nothing about it. So uh, this is just to give a, a glimpse of how the oil economy could be affected uh, uh, by the global action on climate. Right, so um, uh, in the next uh, uh, few slides, uh, I will try uh, to uh, give um, a picture uh, uh, of uh, how the Gulf Arab states are responding uh, to, uh, to climate change and its implication uh, on the economy. Uh, I'll speak about the role of the government and then as well as how the citizens uh, are, are, are taking uh, part also in addressing the climate change. So, so, um, uh, since the entry of the Paris Agreement into force, uh, uh, we have seen all the Gulf Arab states have uh, signed and ratified the Paris Cli uh, Climate Agreement. Uh, and most importantly, uh, all the Gulf Arab states have submitted their nationally determined contributions where they listed um, their climate mitigation and adaptation uh, ambitions. However, um, what I want to emphasize on in here, uh, there is a difference between uh, international governance of climate change and the domestic governance of the climate change. So uh, the most important thing to know is that NDCs or the nationally determined contributions are not enough. Uh, uh, they are not reflecting how much uh, the country is doing in terms of its climate action. So these are just ambitions and they are submitted to the UN. Uh, what needs to be done is to translate those ambitions into an action on the ground. And the first step to do that is to, um, uh, to develop a national climate strategy. So uh, do the Gulf Arab states have uh, national climate strategies? Yes, but not all of them. Uh, Oman, uh, Qatar and the UAE has most recently uh, developed uh, national climate strategies um, to, uh, to uh, both uh, uh, have a roadmap on how they can achieve the climate mitigation and adaptation measures. But again, uh, uh, I don't want to say here that the Gulf Arab states are, haven't been doing anything uh, in addressing the climate-related uh, issues uh, until the uh, uh, until the, the, the Paris Agreement or until uh, 2015. Um, I, I would like to highlight that the Gulf Arab states have been uh, um, uh, active in terms of their role in addressing the climate change, 
even before the Paris Agreement. So uh, in the last column in this uh, table, I'm showing some examples. And I will give you an example. For example, Saudi Arabia uh, uh, had uh, the Saudi Green uh, Building Forum uh, since 2010 to uh, enhance uh, the use of um, uh, the uh, energy efficiency in buildings. Uh, it also had, uh, since 2012 and before, uh, a Saudi energy efficiency center, also to promote for the use of the energy efficiency and uh, to reduce the, 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 the use of the energy at the domestic level. The UAE uh, brings a, an interesting example by adopting a green growth strategy. Um, and I think that has been adopted in 2015. Uh, it is interesting because it aims to align the green investments uh, with the uh, economic development vision uh, of the country. Uh, Dubai also uh, for a long time had its integrated energy strategy, which aims to uh, diversify the energy uh, mix uh, uh, by the 2030. So these are a few examples. But I think uh, it is just not enough to have initiatives and to have um, uh, governmental entities without uh, a real action. So I will try to give you some examples of, uh, is there a real uh, action on the ground? Um, so um, uh, another example here is, um, is just to show that the Gulf Arab states have uh, adopted targets for both renewable energy and, and ener uh, energy efficiency. Uh, uh, I had gathered those information in 2018. I'm sure that I need to update them. However, again, what I want to say, uh, it is not enough to have targets uh, without tailoring them with uh, policies and regulations so you can attract the right investments uh, that help to achieve those targets. So in terms of the real uh, investments, uh, for example, uh, in renewable, uh, and, and the region. So many uh, countries in the Gulf Arab states have adopted some uh, policies that enhance uh, the use or the investments on renewables. There are some uh, policies that are related uh, or that encourage the use of solar panels on the rooftop. And then uh, most of the policies are also encouraging the investment, large scale investments on renewables. Uh, um, uh, uh, especially in the electricity sector through the power purchase uh, uh, agreements. So uh, just uh, to give you an idea on how the region is progressing in, its, uh, uh, in terms of its uh, renewable energy development. Uh, so between 2014 and 2018, uh, the, the implementation of renewable has increased uh, uh, by 313% uh, in the electricity sector. Uh, however, however, uh, if we look at the share of renewable energy in uh, total electricity capacity for all of the Gulf states is still less than 1% uh, except for the United Arab Emirates. It's 2% uh, according to the IRENA data. Uh, but in total, it's still less than 1%. This is why in the, uh, we haven't seen the fraction of the renewable in the figure when I was showing the uh, total domestic uh, energy consumption uh, in the region. So, um, so in today's presentation, I haven't brought a lot of uh, analytical value. I just wanted to give an idea of what is going on in terms of climate action uh, in the region. But if you would be interested uh, on, for example, whether the speed of the renewable energy and uh, investment uh, in the region is going fast enough, uh, then I have written an article in 2019, uh, I guess. Uh, so I, I, I analyzed, analyzed uh, whether the Gulf uh, Arab states are going in a, in a good speed to achieve their renewable energy targets. Um, I have a, a reference to the article uh, by the end of the presentation. Um, so uh, another thing, uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, Saudi Arabia. 
So as maybe many of you know that uh, Saudi Arabia is uh, chairing the G20 uh, uh, this year. Uh, so I have been um, an integral part of the T20 Saudi Arabia coordinating a task force on climate change and environment. And this picture, we have taken it uh, uh, when we conclude the work on the task force uh, uh, two weeks ago. Um, so one of the most important things that Saudi Arabia has uh, proposed this year is the, uh, the uh, concept of circular carbon economy. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that, and especially for, uh, for, for, for the countries that depends heavily uh, on the oil as uh, the main source of income, it means that um, uh, instead of um, just um, uh, uh, avoiding the use of oil, uh, then we should just do something about uh, the problem, which is the, the carbon emissions. So, uh, so this approach enables uh, the use of uh, the fossil fuels, but at the same time, uh, it helps to do something about the carbon emissions that are associated uh, with the fossil fuels. And the way it could be done, uh, there are four ways, or what is called four R's. So um, uh, that means uh, the carbon emissions could be uh, reduced, reused, recycled, or removed. And it's, uh, this approach is actually about everything. Uh, 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 there are a lot of uh, alternative uh, energy technologies. Uh, there's the renewable, the energy efficiency, the, uh, the bioenergy, the carbon capture and storage. Uh, uh, if, we, if we manage to um, uh, uh, use uh, all of those kind, a mix of those uh, uh, technologies all together, then uh, we could help uh, to uh, continue the use of the fossil fuels, but at the same time reduce or completely get rid of the carbon emissions that cause the climate change. But um, I think uh, what I like most about this approach, the circular carbon economy, is the reuse. Because in the reuse, uh, you take the carbon emissions and then you uh, use it in a different way. Uh, uh, with the aim of creating value out of it, so you can make, manufacture something uh, useful, uh, like um, uh, um, uh, you know, like uh, use it in the um, uh, feed stop and fuel. So um, I just I, I I know like I haven't given any exhaustive a list of what is going on in terms of climate action in the region. But I just want to show that the Gulf region is progressing uh, in terms of uh, uh, addressing the climate change. Um, uh, but the question is whether that uh, fast enough um, uh, and uh, then uh, uh, I don't have uh, much time like uh, to give analytical value uh, of uh, what is going on. Uh, but if you are interested, I'm going to uh, give, uh, in the last slide, I will have give uh, some examples of the studies where you can read more about um, uh, and have more of analytical value on the climate action in the region. And then uh, before uh, concluding, um, uh, so here I just wanted to give uh, you an um, uh, a glimpse of how the citizens and the youth are actually uh, are, uh, um, believing or not on the climate change and their role in addressing the climate change. So we don't have uh, much of empirical information uh, in terms of how the people uh, think about the climate change in the region. Uh, but uh, there is a survey that has been conducted by the UGOP, which is an international organization, and it shows uh, it has been conducted uh, on the youth of the age 19 uh, to 29, and it shows that 90% of millennia believe in climate change, but uh, only 6% uh, 
think that uh, it is a, a top, it should be considered as a top uh, priority. Uh, another survey which has been conducted by the uh, uh, World Economic Forum in 2019, which looks at the, uh, the, the, the top risks in, in the MENA region and across the, group, the globe. So this survey have been conducted uh, across the stakeholders. Uh, uh, for example, uh, the business leaders, the CEOs, uh, the policy makers uh, in the region, and they were asked about their opinion about the top 10 risks in the MENA. So uh, if we look at this list, we can see the energy price shock, uh, unemployment uh, or under an employment and terrorist attacks are the uh, are at the top and if we look at the uh, at the list the whole list we can see water crisis coming number eight but we don't see climate change yet uh, uh, on the list but at, uh, from a global perspective climate change came at the top uh, of the list it is considered at uh, one of the top 10 risks uh, globally but for the region it's still not there yet A, another interesting example, also uh, it's a, a survey that has been done for the World Economic Forum uh, and this has been done very most recently uh, to just give uh, get the, the opinion of the people on how they, do they think uh, about uh, the recovery from the COVID-19 and whether it should, uh, the sustainable element should be part of it. And so here we have uh, one of the countries uh, that have been surveyed is Saudi Arabia. And uh, the survey shows that 47% uh, uh, of people uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, think that it is uh, uh, strongly important to uh, uh, integrate the sustainability and equitability as part of the recovery from the COVID-19. So here's just an idea of uh, how the people think about the climate change uh, in the region. And then lastly, this will be uh, my uh, last slide. Uh, uh, this is uh, just to get a little bit of analytical uh, lens on, on uh, the challenges and opportunities for climate policy. Uh, in, in, in the region. And uh, this is, uh, I would summarize uh, the brief outcomes of uh, the study that have been published most recently. Um, so uh, we've done this study uh, and we focused in Oman and the UAE uh, and the major outcomes uh, in terms of what are the challenges and opportunities for climate action in the region. Uh, the, the most important thing was that the, the, the data, the availability, quality, uh, and accessibility to the climate-related data are still uh, serious challenges for the policymakers in Oman and the UAE, uh, despite uh, the progress that have been done already in terms of uh, collecting and analyzing uh, the climate-related data. Secondly, Although there are uh, institutions uh, across the Gulf Arab states that are uh, actively involved in climate action, uh, but um, uh, like for example, there are the ministries of the environment in here. However, uh, their climate action is still lagging behind. Um, and third, uh, there are shortfalls uh, in terms of climate related uh, finance and human resource capacities that are needed to address the climate change. And last but uh, not uh, least, uh, so in terms of, uh, if we looked at the, uh, uh, the, the most of the climate action that have been, uh, or the efforts uh, of the climate action in the region, they are mostly concentrated uh, and uh, um, Although like in my presentation, I highlighted in the energy sector, uh, but uh, in this study, we've tried to look at the, the bigger picture. And then we realized that most of the efforts are focused on, uh, uh, on the energy sector. 
uh, with the purpose of extending uh, the, the use of the oil and gas rather than uh, really advancing the low carbon transformation uh, of the economy. So, um, so I think I would uh, conclude uh, with, the, with, uh, with that. Uh, so here, if you are looking for further um, studies uh, and if you are looking for more of the analytical value on the climate action in the region, uh, I would invite you to read the work that I have done uh, myself and with my colleagues uh, on this topic uh, over the last few years. Uh, and with that, uh, I would like to say thank you very much for listening to me and for attending today's uh, webinar. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aisha. Uh, that was very informative. Uh, I think you laid out very clearly the issues uh, and I found a lot of the visual aids very useful. Um, so I'd like to open the Q&A <laughs> now. If you would, if you want to ask a question, please click the raise hand button on the Zoom toolbar. Um, then you can unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Um, remember to introduce yourself. Uh, state your name and affiliation and, you know, make sure your comment ends in a question. Um, check. Okay, uh, it appears we don't have any questions at the moment. While you're getting your questions together, uh, maybe let me pose one. Um, uh, Dr. Aisha, the coronavirus pandemic has introduced a significant factor of uncertainty into policy making worldwide. Um, I, I, I like your slide. I found your slide on um, the various plans and, you know, uh, and then you went on to assess if real action on the ground uh, has been taken. I, uh, I found that useful, but um, what do you think of the implications of the pandemic on, you know, climate change policies and, you know, the responses of the Arab Gulf governments? Right. So, yes. So, <clears throat> So the COVID-19 has been a challenging, uh, not only for the Gulf countries, but also globally. Uh, but specifically for the Gulf uh, Arab states, it, it, it brought a double uh, challenge. So the Gulf countries are in a position to prioritize the health sector so they can protect the human lives. And they are also in a position, we saw like how the uh, COVID-19 has actually, uh, uh, and because of the lockdown measures has uh, contributed in reducing uh, the demand for the oil. Uh, so that has been associated with further decline in the oil prices uh, for the region. So there is a huge uh, economic uh, challenge uh, for, for, for the region. And so far, uh, of course, the Gulf Arab states, uh, like any other parts in the world have uh, uh, introduced some uh, stimulus measures uh, to shore up the economy. Uh, but most of those have been, uh, you know, uh, targeted towards the health, uh, as well as the, uh, uh, the, the other, uh, to help other uh, domestic businesses uh, uh, in the region. In terms of uh, uh, whether any of that money that have been injected in the economy uh, have gone into um, into uh, climate related investments uh, uh, the only uh, maybe uh, it is too early to see uh, uh, that kind of um, uh, investment at the moment but looking at the UN ESQA uh, data uh, we can see that uh, most of the uh, the money has been uh, allocated uh, uh, to uh, help uh, the domestic businesses uh, as well as uh, towards the uh, health uh, sector. Uh, we haven't seen an uh, investment that particularly uh, directed towards the climate related uh, uh, sector. Thanks. Yeah, um, I agree. I, I... I mean, the region's governments are faced with a kind of conundrum right now. Uh, they need to jumpstart the, the economic recovery uh, as soon as possible. And I mean, understandably, climate change, uh, I mean, climate action, you know, continuing to, continuing their targeted reduction measures, it's not going to be at the top of their agendas. 
um, I mean, how, how do you think economic recovery or economic stimulus policies uh, and climate change, climate action can be combined? You know, and keeping in mind the narrow constraints that the Arab Gulf governments find themselves in, you know, how, how, how can they make this uh, politically palatable? Um, you know, I, I just saw the numbers uh, for Saudi Arabia, I think the, there was a report saying that um, the worst may be coming, uh, seeing a jump in the un un unemployment rate and uh, a lot of other financial indicators that are quite negative. Yeah. So I think I think uh, yes, it is a challenging time, and yes, uh, maybe if if we don't put direct money uh, to invest uh, on the climate uh, at this time, uh, actually it is a good time to uh, play around with uh, policies and regulations, so that wouldn't require uh, you know uh, uh, investing direct amounts of money in there. But uh, because uh, you know uh, the the fuel uh, the the energy prices are low at the moment, it's a really good opportunity to revisit uh, the, for example, uh, the electricity prices, uh, the subsidies that are allocated uh, uh, for the energy sector and many other sectors, and it is a good time to um, uh, revise the subsidies uh, at the moment. Uh, that would help actually uh, to reduce the uh, social shock that could be associated with increasing the fuel prices. But now it is a good time. And also uh, it is a good time to look at the energy efficiency measures because energy efficiency is a low hanging uh, fruit um, uh, compared to other uh, alternative investments like the renewable. Um, uh, so I think uh, revising the measures associated with the fossil fuel subsidies as well as the energy efficiency is a good start for the Gulf Arab states. It would help in the short term and it would help also in the, in the long term. Okay. Thanks, Aisha. Um, I have a question from uh, my colleague, uh, Ben Chin. Uh, ben Chin, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Dr. Aisha. Thanks so much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. It was very informative. Uh, I just have a question for you about, um, because I was looking at the overview, overview that you gave about uh, the various countries in the Gulf and how they were looking to address climate change. Um, you have a lot of national strategy. So my question is, what do, you, um, do you think that this um, climate change problem is one that could be addressed by the countries in the Gulf together regionally? And um, by that, um, I'm also thinking um, of, you know, not just uh, the GCC states, but maybe also uh, Iraq and Iran. Do you think that this is something that could be viable? Thanks so much. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. Yeah, I think this is a, a really good question. Uh, so yes, um, climate action is not uh, restricted, shouldn't be restricted at the domestic uh, level. Uh, and also because the climate change impacts are not respecting borders, so the effects of the climate change can be felt across borders. And that means that there will need a, a cooperation between countries in terms of uh, climate action. And uh, again, uh, there, there is, um, there is uh, opportunities out there uh, if the countries come together and cooperate. For example, uh, the, the Gulf countries ha has already started, uh, for example, uh, the uh, electricity uh, grid network between uh, the, the six Gulf Arab states. And uh, that means that if we integrate the renewables, then we could enhance uh, uh, investments of the renewables across the Gulf Arab states. Um, uh, the, the, uh, but if your question is whether the Gulf Arab countries are doing enough in terms of their cooperation in addressing the climate change. Well, uh, uh, myself and my colleague, uh, Dr. Mary Lumi, we have published a paper in 2019, uh, and we assist uh, the uh, climate change uh, uh, governance uh, uh, in the Arab region. Uh, for the Gulf Arab states, the Gulf uh, uh, 
which is the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council, uh, is uh, having a department which oversees uh, the uh, environmental and climate related uh, uh, cooperation across the region. Uh, but uh, our concern was that, uh, well, there are regulations out there. Uh, our concern was uh, those regulations are uh, outdated. And uh, uh, in terms of implementation, there is not much uh, going on. Uh, uh, we, we think that more needs to be done in terms of enhancing the cooperation between uh, the Gulf countries, not only in terms of, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the mitigation of climate change and the focus on the energy sector itself, but also in terms of the adaptation. And so, for example, the water, the water uh, scarcity is an issue uh, for, for, for the Gulf Arab states and also the, the other countries around it. Uh, you mentioned Iraq, uh, yes. Uh, so there, there would be an opportunity for, for uh, more of the opportunities uh, for, for the countries to come together and uh, they can focus, uh, for example, they can look at uh, different things. For example, uh, uh, the capacity building, uh, the transfer of the technology uh, between countries, as well as, you know, because there are differentiations between uh, how much finance uh, uh, countries do have. So they can cooperate in those areas, but they can also, uh, uh, with that, they can um, I think of opportunities like, for example, the job creation. Uh, so unemployment is a huge issue uh, in the region. So they can th think about the job creation uh, in the region and how that cooperation could help uh, uh, in this sense and uh, if we uh, integrate the uh, climate-related investments. Thanks so much. Thanks, Aisha. Um, you mentioned uh, the, right, quite rightly that the climate change, uh, I mean, the effects of climate change, uh, they don't recognize borders. Uh, and, you know, much since much of the Middle East is projected to become uninhabitable in several decades' time, uh, this will result in mass movement of people uh, and straining both cities and borders. Uh, so, how, how can I get your take on this you know, problem of climate refugees? Because I mean, climate change, the effects don't recognize borders. So, I mean, even if the, the richer, the wealthier Gulf countries are able to manage the problem uh, somewhat passively, uh, they, they will not necessarily be inoculated or insulated from you know, what happens from the rest of the region. Yeah, so yeah, again, this is an excellent question. Um, uh, I might not be in a good position uh, to uh, expand farther in this point because uh, I haven't done much uh, in terms of studying the impacts of climate change uh, on migration. Uh, but uh, I know, for example, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Marwa Dawoodi, who has uh, most recently uh, published a book uh, on uh, looking at how the climate change has uh, actually uh, uh, exacerbated the issue of uh, the conflict in Syria, uh, and um, uh, and there are some uh, studies that shows that uh, uh, the, the the most recent incidents in Syria have been uh, uh, linked to the climate change uh, in terms of uh, affecting the food security uh, in there and affecting the uh, uh, the uh, uh, water. Uh, uh, scarcity or exacerbating the issue of the water scarcity and that uh, has forced the people to migrate from uh, rural areas to the urban areas but again for Syria the people are enforced to move uh, outside the Syria so if the climate change is uh, playing a role in there uh, it's going to be bringing also challenges also to the uh, um, to the uh, refugee campaigns uh, bringing uh, the uh, other issues like the health issues uh, that affects the people. But uh, I think from all of this, I think because uh, these are not far away from the Gulf Arab states, uh, uh, this should be considered also uh, on how the Gulf Arab countries maybe in the future is, uh, are going to consider uh, the migration of the people uh, from countries that suffer from the conflict 
and uh, that suffers from uh, further impacts of the climate change. But again, I'm not uh, pretty much uh, specialized in this topic. And uh, 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 yeah, so uh, this is uh, my brief take. Thank you, Aisha. Um, now, um, you mentioned that um, there was a slide in your presentation uh, covered the uh, pledges that the GCC countries have uh, put in place to reduce emissions. Uh, maybe you could share uh, a bit on the the concrete plans on how some of the GCC countries uh, plan to mitigate the effects of climate change? Right. Uh, again, this is another good question. So uh, in, in the research that uh, I have been doing, uh, I've been looking, uh, yes, uh, whether the, the, the initiatives and the strategies that we have uh, on the ground, do they have concrete plans uh, on achieving the targets that are in place? Unfortunately, not. So there are targets uh, out there, uh, but then the strategy uh, or the roadmap that is needed to achieve those targets is not clear. So, for example, we see uh, an, uh, a development of uh, policies uh, that enhance the climate action, for example, uh, for renewable energy or the energy efficiency. But the development of those policies is uh, is happening in an ad hoc basis. So we would, for example, see that there is a, a new policy on promoting the installation of solar panels uh, on the rooftops. Uh, but um, uh, uh, but um, uh, what I would uh, prefer to see, for example, we can uh, actually have a, a concrete plan. So we can start with something like um, a pilot, uh, uh, pilot policy first, and, and then from that we can learn about what are the challenges uh, that has arised from implementing that uh, specific policy. Uh, and then, uh, for example, there could be some technical challenges, there could be some uh, financial issues that are associated with the implementation uh, of uh, renewable energy, uh, the, the, uh, the staff themselves, they could learn about the, uh, uh, the, the, the capacity of the human resources on uh, handling those kind of new policies. And from that, uh, they can uh, uh, go a step farther in the next uh, year or two and uh, implement that pilot policy into a larger scale uh, and then they can think of what uh, uh, the sectors that can be, uh, uh, in, in which uh, sectors the, the new policy can be implemented. So this kind of um, concrete plans is not there yet. And also in terms of the targets, we can see uh, again, uh, we can see that there, there is reluctance on putting uh, the targets. So sometimes you will see a, a huge, uh, 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 there is a, a big target for renewable energy and out of sudden we will see that a target has been uh, downgraded or scaled back uh, into a, a lower number. Uh, and that is because that uh, the policy makers, when they put a, a target, there needs to be um, a concrete study before putting the target forward. So we need to think about how visible that target it is and can we achieve that target before actually issuing the target? Okay. In terms of the private sector, um, I mean, what has the role of the private sector been? And uh, I mean, you know, usually it's the state companies that are the natural leaders of you know, many of these large scale green projects. Uh, but, you know, the challenge is really for the government to take the lead while unleashing, you know, the capabilities of the private sector, both in terms of domestic and foreign. Uh, how has the, what has the role of the private sector been and has, right. have the governments been able to put in place, you know, a, a, a viable framework for, you know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure. So, um, so the role of the private sector is really important. Uh, first of all, it is if we don't 
talk about the climate change uh, is the role of the private sector is really important for uh, the economic diversification in the region. And the private sector will not be active without the, the intervention of the government uh, or the role of the uh, government. Uh, 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 is there anything uh, happening in terms of the role of the private sector? Yes. So there are, the private sector is involved uh, in the region uh, and investing, investing in, for example, renewable energy um, or uh, um, energy efficiency. But again, uh, the role of the government is important. However, uh, in uh, one of my studies uh, that I have done, uh, so we looked at uh, where the investments, so this paper is not published yet, but we looked at the uh, renewable energy investments and we uh, figured out that these are pretty much dominated by the, uh, the government or the state-owned enterprises and the role of the private sector is not really uh, 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 significant at the moment. Uh, so that is because uh, the, the government is playing, still playing a significant role uh, in the economic development and planning. And that's also reflected on uh, the importance uh, role of the government in terms of when it comes also to the uh, uh, addressing the climate related issues. But again, to um, make the role of the private uh, sector uh, active, there, there will be a, a need for the governmental intervention in terms of, for example, uh, uh, putting the targets uh, forward as well as uh, 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 bringing about a clear uh, and, uh, and transparency in terms of the policies and the regulations. Uh, so just in short, the private sector is involved, but is that uh, uh, good enough? And I think there, there uh, more needs to be done in this area. Yeah, I guess the state has to water the desert, uh, so the green shoots of innovation and entrepreneurship can you know, grow. Uh, well, I, I have a question from uh, Jason Kong. Um, he says, uh, with the UAE running a nuclear power plant as a cleaner form of energy, and the sensitivity around usage of nuclear power in this region, do you see other GCC members following the steps of the UAE to go into nuclear power production as well? And actually, it, this, sorry, this reminds me of a report I read this morning where there's a study that says that nuclear power actually hinders the, the fight against climate change. But that's just a, a, a just comment, but I can go ahead. Yeah, so again, um... Uh, I, I would answer the question very briefly, but uh, uh, I'm not pretty much uh, specialized uh, in nuclear uh, uh, energy. Um, um, and, and again, I know uh, the nuclear, there is a controversy around the, the use of the nuclear power, but whether there is a, a, the, a Gulf state that's following uh, suit the UAE, uh, I think Saudi Arabia is planning to have a nuclear plant uh, to meet the, uh, the increase in the domestic uh, demand uh, of the energy. And I think, uh, yes, what is driving uh, uh, the thing behind the use of the nuclear, or if you could also think of the use of coal, uh, is actually the growth in the demand uh, uh, for the energy uh, in the region. And as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, uh, UAE uh, uh, is among the, the countries which also relies on the import of the natural gas. So the development of the nuclear is one way of to reduce the dependence on uh, natural gas import. Uh, um, whether that's uh, nuclear is acceptable or what is, uh, whether it's uh, hindering the uh, climate action, uh, I would leave it, uh, uh, I mean, for the people to think about it, uh, but um, um, uh, uh, yeah, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I, have a, I have another question from Feng Jin. Uh, Feng Jin, you want to go ahead? Yeah, thanks, Tatiana. Um, Dr. Aisha, I was just um, wondering about something. So. Um, you know, as, as you discussed earlier, uh, climate change is a good, you know, opportunity for states in the Gulf to cooperate together to try to address the issue. 
But it also seems that the, the um, effects of climate change, you know, such, such as um, possibly worsening uh, food insecurity and water insecurity, um, these are things that states uh, you know, can be very careful about. And you know, as we have seen recently in the Qatar uh, blockade, uh, you know, if anything, uh, uh, it's probably shown how, um, how significant these issues can be. So I'm just wondering, you know, maybe just, just to get your view on this, do you think the climate change challenge would uh, you know, end up drawing states closer together or because of, you know, they're trying to find their ways um, to reduce their vulnerabilities you know, in areas such as food and water insecurity, you actually heighten tensions in the region. Thanks so much. Well, thank you very much, Feng. Um, another um, good question, uh, but also a difficult uh, question to answer. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, whether climate change will bring the Gulf Arab states together or not, I think um, even if we think about this question uh, in <clears throat> Uh, from a global perspective, uh, I think uh, the impacts of the climate change uh, uh, should uh, bring the countries uh, together, because uh, especially for the Gulf Arab states, um, uh, they are sharing the same culture. Uh, they are uh, more or less having <clears throat> similar structure in the economy. Uh, so, um, and also they are the same uh, uh, zone in, ter uh, uh, in terms of how the temperature is going to increase. And so they are more or less facing the same uh, impacts of the climate change. Uh, but again, there, there are also, it's important to highlight on how they are differentiated in their socio-economic uh, um, uh, context and uh, how they are also differentiated in terms of their uh, financial uh, resources. Uh, so if we think about the uh, 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 super rentier states, like, uh, you know, uh, we can take the example of the UAE and Qatar uh, and, and, and Kuwait, uh, these could have uh, high financial capacities to uh, face the issues of the climate change, uh, but uh, perhaps uh, if we think about Bahrain and, and Oman, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, I think for Oman, maybe the human capacity is good enough uh, to tackle climate change because uh, the country has been uh, uh, heavily involved in addressing uh, how to tackle the extreme weather events. Uh, but I think the financial issues is something that uh, the um, country could face uh, uh, and uh, the co cooperation between the Gulf Arab states uh, could help in tackling uh, an issue of, uh, for example, the finance. Um, but again, uh, given that um, uh, the, the differentiations on the human capacity, the, the Gulf countries can learn from each other. So I know like I'm not answering your question uh, um, uh, because it's difficult, uh, but uh, my, my take is, uh, is climate change should bring the nations closer together rather than just apart from each other. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Benjin. Um, I, my colleague Asif, uh, Asif Shuja has a question. Asif, you can go ahead. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Aisha, for your uh, uh, enlightening uh, uh, presentation and uh, I wouldn't have asked this question had COVID not happened but now that the COVID has happened he, it has humbled all of us you know even the greatest leaders are in fact infected so in that context uh, uh, because I have seen that uh, more than uh, the effort of the state or the leaders or the giant institutions it is the effort of the common man common people uh, which has brought out the real difference uh, I think uh, uh, climate change is also of a similar nature, catastrophic nature, where the efforts of common people are more important uh, than the state institutions. So in that regard, I wanted to ask you, uh, could you please uh, give us a list of do's and don'ts which uh, we common people can uh, start implementing in our uh, normal life from now itself, you know? Uh, getting away from skepticism and implementing it right away so that we can make our contribution. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so um, I'm not exactly sure if I have understood uh, 
uh, your question, but I think you are asking uh, whether the, the leaders um, are still in the position of uh, being skeptic about climate change uh, or not. Well, uh, from what I have shown in terms of the initiatives and the strategies um, of, uh, of uh, addressing the climate change in the region, or uh, even moving towards uh, developing clean energy investments, I think um, uh, from what I see, uh, uh, at least here, like unlike the USA, uh, so um, the USA, uh, the federal government has withdrawn from the Paris Climate Agreement, but here uh, it is not. Uh, the countries are still engaged in addressing the climate change. Um, uh, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia this year is hosting the G20, and uh, uh, the, I am coordinating a task force on climate change and the environment. And Saudi Arabia has proposed the circular carbon economy, and I think, um, and then the UAE has the green growth strategy. And we have seen that all of the Gulf countries have uh, targets for renewable energy implementation as well as the energy efficiency. I think all of those are signals that uh, the leaders in the region, uh, they are not skeptic uh, about climate change, but they uh, believe on the climate change. Uh, but I think um, perhaps, yes, uh, the awareness is a point uh, to mention in here. Uh, so the awareness about how uh, significant the impacts of the climate change, uh, I think uh, uh, it's still way to go in, in terms of raising the awareness about uh, thinking uh, in the mid and the long term when it comes to the climate change. Uh, I mean, thinking uh, in terms of uh, future planning uh, and economic development, where we actually need to uh, factor climate uh, risks as well as the uh, opportunities. And as I mentioned, I actually I have a few slides, and so maybe I can go through them in here. So, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so there is a study that have been done. And it looks uh, at uh, it looks uh, what would be the economic, environmental, and the social benefits if we enhance the climate action across uh, in the GCC and the other countries in the world. So I brought data for the GCC itself. So this study proposed that if we implement uh, uh, 100 uh, that uh, of the energy comes from renewables, then how uh, the, the the benefits could look like. And so. <clears throat> So here are uh, the, uh, the impacts of the Green Deal on, on the MENA countries. Uh, uh, for all of the countries, uh, we could, if we go for 100 renewables and if we had done it uh, in a proper way, uh, we could see a decline uh, in energy demand for switching to renewables. Um, uh, um, and that is, uh, for, uh, would happen for, uh, for the Gulf Arab states, the decline in the energy uh, could be from uh, 40 uh, to something like 60% uh, decline in the energy use. Uh, also, uh, in the long run, uh, uh, the investments in renewable could uh, create uh, uh, more jobs in terms of the construction and the operation. And, and uh, um, we have for example, uh, we could see uh, something like 600,000 uh, jobs uh, in 40 years time. Um, <clears throat> and here's the reference of the study that I'm speaking about, impacts of green new deal energy plans for uh, on grid stability. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, if you invest in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in renewables, it is also an opportunity to reduce the air pollution. So uh, the region is also uh, having an issue with the air pollution. Uh, and then uh, we could uh, reduce the cost of air pollu uh, pollution uh, health, uh, as well as uh, preventing the premature uh, mortalities uh, uh, by switching uh, to renewable uh, energy. So there are some uh, uh, social, economic, health, uh, um, and environmental benefits of uh, switching to renewables. Uh, 
but um, I think in terms of the action of uh, on the ground, we still need uh, to do more to get there. I hope I answered your question. Oh, um, thanks, uh, Aisha. Um, speaking on awareness, raising awareness and increasing this kind of environmental consciousness, uh, what role does civil society play in, you know, trying to move the needle on, on climate awareness and climate action in the Arab Gulf states? And, and, and what is the relationship between Gulf governments and you know, such groups? Yeah, definitely. So I think um, uh, in this specific part of the world, uh, uh, I wouldn't expect much of a bottom-up approach in terms of the raising the awareness in terms of climate. I think the government, again, would play a significant role in terms of helping the raising the awareness about the climate change. Um, uh, uh, climate science and uh, environmental science needs to be integrated in the education curricula. That would be a good start where we can raise the awareness about uh, the climate change. Um, 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 uh, in terms of the bottom-up approaches, uh, I'm not saying that there is nothing is happening. I know there are some NGOs uh, in the region in here uh, that are uh, actively involved uh, in raising uh, environment and climate related awareness. There is, for example, the Environment Society uh, in Oman. Uh, it is an NGO. Uh, they help a lot with uh, raising uh, uh, awareness about the environmental issues uh, among the youth. Um, um, and also we have seen <coughs> Uh, the global movement, uh, the youth uh, strike for the climate uh, and uh, the, the Friday uh, strikes. Uh, across the globe, you see many countries and the youth in many countries have been involved. In the region, uh, uh, there are some countries. We have seen movement in Abu Dhabi and uh, I think Lebanon. Uh, um, uh, but Abu Dhabi is the only Gulf countries that have where the youth have been engaged on the climate strike. Um, so yes, there is an involvement of, uh, of the youth uh, and the bottom up uh, um, entities. Uh, but I think uh, the government could play a significant role through uh, the integration of the science and climate in the education curricula and through also uh, uh, putting more uh, on the media involving the media uh, in terms of the addressing the issues of the climate change. Okay. Thanks, Aisha. Um, well, we're approaching the end of our uh, session today. Uh, I don't see any other questions. So, um, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aisha. Uh, thank you again for a very insightful and enjoyable session. Um, please join us again next week. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, women and youth as a force for change. and. Dr. Aisha, we hope that you can join us as well. Um, uh, next Thursday, same time, same place. Uh, have, a, have a good evening, everyone. And, and thanks, Aisha, again. Thank you very Bye. much, everyone and the team. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.